Grant us the courage and willingness to be open and honest before you, Lord, in every way as we worship you in spirit and in truth. Let us quiet ourselves in preparation for worship. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We want all people who come to worship this ser to this service to know that they're sincerely welcomed. May all of our wounds fade away as we glorify the God of love and mercy. Good morning. Good morning. In the life of the church, there will be a couple of meetings this week. Well, actually, on Wednesday at 5.30 is room for the table. That's not a meeting, but it's a, I see that it's going to be hosted by the Community of Christ Church, and the speech students will be giving the program from, high, from the school. And down to business, the budget and finance meeting will be on Thursday at 11. 
Always we want you to sign up to be a lay leader if you can. And uh, they invite you to bring music to our service. We have wonderful music through Carol and the piano, but we'd like others to share too. Don't forget if you haven't paid your per capita apportionment. One of the things that's coming up is uh, Rick's retirement, and there will be a reception on uh, the t May 26th, that's a Sunday, from 2 to 4. And we have a sign-up sheet for cookies and bars for that party. It will be back here on the table. Also, you can come to an evening at the movies. That will be this week on Thursday, the 25th at 5.30. It's called Pay, Pay It Forward. And they will provide popcorn and treats. So there's an outing for you. Anything else? Anybody have another announcement? No? Nope. Well, today is Clara Schaff's birthday. I know that. And, of course, <laughs> Rick's is coming up this week also. Our gathering hymn is in Sing the Faith, 2061. And Bennett had a birthday yesterday. Oh, yes. Yeah. It's not every day that a guy turns 21, right? <laughs> so, um, this gathering song is to a familiar tune. It's to uh, immortal, invisible, God only wise. But here's the deal. Why don't I play through this once, just, uh, and then I'm going to invite you to sing the, the uh, first four verses of this. Um. Hmm. We can do this? Yeah. Let's give her a whirl. What's the worst that could happen? No, don't answer. join me in the responsive call to worship. Let us worship God together. Let us sing to the Lord a new song, a song with and for all creation. Let us rejoice in what God has created. It is good. Let us marvel at the creatures, wonderful in God's sight. Let us extol God's handiwork. 
We come in wonder and stand in awe of the world before us. Every creature gives you praise. Our hymn of praise, number 32 in the hymnal, I sing the mighty power of God. of the Easter season continues as we are called to live as a part of God's new creation. But we often fail to be good partners in caring for what God has entrusted to us. Let us seek the forgiveness we need through the confession of our sin. Let us pray. Compassionate God, we, we too, too often ignore, ignore the signs, the signs and, and suffering of your, your creation. creation. Our, Our lives are bound up, up with, with the soil, the water, the air, the air and other species. And, and we, we ask forgiveness for the ways, for the ways in, which in which we mistreat each, each of these. Give us, Give us clean, clean hearts and caring hands, hands, O God. God. Remind, Remind us that, that we are made in your image made to be good stewards, and made for shalom. In the name of Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. And the responsive assurance of God's grace, God declares the creation good. We are humbled that God calls on us to be partners in creating. We are humbled that God calls us to be partners in creating what is sustainable. With hope and inspiration, we answer that call. And we place our trust in God to heal us and show us the way. Doris, thank you for your help this morning. The young people, please come forward for some time together up front. On the stairs. Did you think it, you think maybe it'll have something to do with this? Well, it does have something to do with this. This is our world, the earth, right? And this here is our country. And this is Kansas City. Yeah. 
If the moon covers the sun, it's a solar eclipse. Hmm? Can we try a solar eclipse? We need a moon. Hmm? Your hand can be the moon? Well, go ahead. Where's the sun? Sun's over here. All right? Oh, it's a solar eclipse, and it works. Good job, buddy. Mm. Yeah, you could do that too. Hey, I've got an. I got a question. The question is, do you ever have to clean up your room? Yeah. No. Yeah, I don't believe that one. Do you like cleaning up your room? No. Eh, some people say yes. Some people say no. Right. Why do you have to clean up your room? It's real, if you don't, it's messy. So then our folks make us because it makes us happy. What, happened, what would happen if you didn't clean up your room? You would, first of all, you'd get grounded. You'd get in trouble. Mice in your room, bad idea, messy, it would look like a dumpster, and it would smell bad. Maybe you would lose something, hmm? A tornado hit? Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe something might get broken, hmm? Maybe you would run out of clean clothes, Maybe. Right? Who? Okay, so this is uh, the earth, right? Mm hmm. What is that called? Solar eclipse. Who made the earth? God. God? Yep. Who made the trees? God. Who made the rocks? God. Who made the dirt? God. Who made the water? Who made you? God. Yeah. 4.5 billion years ago, God started something that turned out to be a world, right? Islands. What else? All together. All the continents used to be together, right? Mm -hmm. It's a great world, and God asks us to help care for it. Sort of like cleaning up our room. God asks us to help to clean up the world, right? Which, so what are some ways that we can help clean up the world? Pick up trash. Uh, yeah. Mm hmm. Make it clean and healthy, right? Uh, recycle? Yeah, <laughs> well, recycling, Jenks. God, I have something for you. It is a picture of the world, and there are some things on here that mm -hmm, remind us to help. Hmm? Yeah, there, I don't. I think I have it. Everybody gets one. Hmm? What's that? Don't litter. Hmm? Yeah. Yep. No. I don't know. I didn't hear what you said. What? Well, let's pray that the leak in the ceiling gets fixed, shall we? Let's do that right now. God, help fix the leak in the ceiling. And help us take care of the earth. Amen. Thanks for coming up. I, I'm now going to pronounce the benediction.
Why is he still talking? I invite you to join your hearts, minds, and spirits together with me in a moment of prayer. Your creation is marvelous, God, and in your grace and love we find our place in it. And we have a special place that is designed by you. Help us in this time and place to hear of your love for us, to be reminded of your love for all creation, and to imagine what our part might be in helping you to keep it good. For we would ask these things and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Bible passage this morning, friends, is taken from the beginning, the very first chapter, the very first verses of the book of Genesis. It is a story of creation care, and a story that each of us and all of us are invited to find a place in and to imagine ourselves to be a part of that creation care. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep while a wind from God swept over the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning. The first day. Moving to chapter 1, verses 26 through 28. We're skipping over a little bit of God's handiwork, but we're coming to an important part in the creation story. Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and every other creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Once upon a time, a medical doctor, a civil engineer, and a computer scientist were having an argument with each other about which profession was the oldest. And the doctor said, well, you know, it says in the book of Genesis that Eve was created, taken from a rib from Adam. Well, somebody had to do the surgery. So I can rightly claim that my profession is the oldest. Hmm. Well, the civil engineer had something to say about that and chimed in by saying, yeah, but. Earlier in the book of Genesis, it says that God created order of the heaven and the earth out of chaos. So this was obviously the first and certainly most spectacular feat of civil engineering ever. Sorry, Doc, but I think my profession is the oldest. And it was at that point that the computer scientist leaned back 
in his chair, smiled and confidently said, Ah, but who do you think created the chaos? I have long suspected this. As someone who is frustrated, challenged by, confused by, stumped by technology, the computer scientist will get no argument from me. I have a smartphone. I use it as a phone. There are things on my smartphone that I have never touched and wouldn't know the first thing to do with. I leave them alone because I know if I start pushing buttons, you know what there will be? Chaos. Nonetheless, I agree with those three about where it all began with Genesis. It all begins in Genesis. And it all begins in this way. In the beginning, God created. In the beginning, God created. So from a Genesis standpoint, from a theological perspective, the response to chaos is always sacred creativity. See, I want to say that one again. The response to chaos is always sacred creativity. It begins with creating, and I take some comfort that from the beginning, we are reminded that in the beginning, God began by creating goodness from the midst of chaos. There are some scholars who believe that God created everything out of nothing. Everything out of nothing. There was nothing. God started creating. There's everything. The author of Genesis does not put it that way. God doesn't start completely from scratch in Genesis. In Genesis, God starts with chaos. And chaos is the raw material for sacred creativity. The updated New Revised Bible translation offers this for Genesis 1, when God began to create the heavens and the earth, <laughs> <laughs> the earth was complete chaos. Complete chaos. Doesn't it still feel that way sometimes? I mean, you kind of look around and, and you're wondering and you're thinking, man, this feels like chaos. This looks like chaos. This smells like chaos. Might be chaos. The Hebrew phrase for that is tohu vavohu, a primordial chaos, a formless void and darkness. It was personified by the wild and chaotic sea. The sea was always the Hebrew people's worst nightmare. Chaos. It's big, it's deep, it's uncontrollable, it's wild, and weird things live there. Don't want no part of chaos. Seems that God does God's best work in the midst of chaos, and that to me sounds like good news. That God does God's best work when things feel and seem and appear to be chaos. There's no chaos too big for God. Not in the beginning, not in the middle, not at the end. Chaos happens. Sometimes the chaos happens 
because of our own making and sometimes due to no fault of our own. But the good news is that God is still creating something good out of the chaos business, and here's something else, that God is still in the business of looking for partners, looking for helpers in this process of sacred creativity. You could see a hand on a poster pointing at you. God needs you. Helper, partner, co-creator. God needs you. Because that is what we have been made to be. God is still in the business of looking for people to roll up their sleeves and join in the creative process with God. But we would do well before we roll up our sleeves to remember our place in the creation, to, to remember our role, our function properly. Because when we forget our place in creation, the result, more often than not, is more chaos. Eh? I am an expert at creating chaos. I am really good at it. And here... I don't even have to try. Happens. But more often than not, let me tell you, it happens when I'm not paying attention. Huh? Chaos. We have a place in this process. Humanity is created in great dignity and with special power and responsibility. It is truly something to be made in the image and likeness of God. That's no small matter. But humanity was never meant to be in complete control of creation apart from God. You have to unpack terms like dominion. You have to unpack a word like subdue. It doesn't mean lord it over everything. It doesn't mean that God gave you the right to do whatever you want to do with the world. It doesn't mean that. Because when we do that, we've lost our place. We've lost our role. We forget that we are co-creators in this sacred creativity business. It doesn't mean that we can do whatever we please with everything for our own purposes and our own use because we share the place with a lot of creation, a lot of good creation. And some of the greatest tragedies in history have been the result of when we are not paying attention, when we misunderstand our role and our place in the greater scheme of things, when we become short-sighted. Short-sighted is a problem, especially when we're talking about something as big as the world We could ask some of the species that have gone extinct, except, well, we can't really ask them, can we? We look around and we see environmental stress, inequity among people due to human overreach. Storms are bigger, more frequent, more intense. But I want to tell you something, folks. This morning, I am hopeful. This morning, I am very hopeful. Because God still calls humanity not to be in control, but to be co-creators of what is good and right and life-giving and sustainable for all creation. You have been called to be a steward. You have been called to help clean up the place for the good of everyone. 
And this morning I'm hopeful because I've heard some and seen some evidence that chaos and greed and human foolishness don't get the last word. Chaos doesn't get the last word. Chaos never gets the last word. As with everything else, God does. I owe a lot to John Comperda for the inspiration of this sermon, and he makes a claim. You may not agree with it, but it, it, it might be worth considering. God is not in control. God is creating. Well, see, I want to take a little bit of issue with that because in my theology, I want God to be both. <laughs> I want God to be in control, and I want God to be so in control that God is still creating, right? And I want God to be so confident in God's ability to create that God lets us share in it. You know how, you know how sometimes if a, if a, if a, a, a child, it's their first opportunity to try to bake a cake with their parent, right? First opportunity. First time solo in the kitchen like this, right? What is, what does a good parent do in that process? Well, let's make a cake together. Where do we start? How about this? You want to try it? Well, I I'm right here. I'll help. But you got this. You're smart. You're talented. I'll help. Let's make a cake. I want God to be in control, and I want God to still be creating. I want God to take the tohu vavohu, the chaos, and speak, and have something good emerge out of that. I want and need a God who helps us create something good out of some of the messes we're in, and lately I've heard and seen some things that have shown this. I have been watching and I have been mesmerized by and inspired by the Nova series on PBS, A Brief History of the Future. I've been watching this and it's been giving me some hope because you've heard all the doomsday scenarios. You're familiar with the doomsday, the hope. And the creativity doesn't always get the headlines. You know what gets the headlines? Ah! The world is on fire! Well, yeah, but there's more. So, they've been showing people that are doing things, that are rolling up their sleeves, and that are not running away from the chaos, but applying creativity to it and trying to do something good and better. Like this. In Morocco, there is one of the largest solar panel fields in the world. And it is helping the entire nation of Morocco to be more energy efficient and to do so without a whole bunch of other negative consequences. Do you know that there is currently a nuclear fusion project that has duplicated nuclear fusion twice? What that means is this. They've got a big machine and two atoms knock into each other. And you know what happens when two atoms knock into each other? You get a little mini sun. They're fused. And there's enough energy in nuclear fusion so that everybody on the planet will have all the energy that they need. They're doing this. And you know the best part? There isn't any waste. There isn't anything that we have to get rid of after that. You know, like nuclear power plants, you know, you know, the, the nuclear waste that we have to figure out something to do with. Not with this. There are communities in New York and Japan and in Wales 
that are gathering people in the community and asking them, what kind of community do you really want to live in? What kind of world do you really want to live in? What would be good? What would be good for us? And then they ask an even more important question, and this is really where I want to lock in, folks. They're asking not just what would be good for us, but what would be good for somebody seven generations after us. Because, see, that's really the trick. That's where we want to apply our best selves, is so that somebody seven generations after us will have a world that we thought of that for, for them to inhabit. Not just us. Not just what we want, what would be a good place for them. And they're starting to plan that way and act that way because you know. Hmm. I think there were people here seven generations before us. What do you think? Hmm? Huh? And some of the choices and some of the decisions they made, guess who they're affecting? Oh, yeah, us, right? They call it, I learned a new phrase, and I really like it, cathedral thinking. You ever heard of cathedral thinking? This is so cool. Now listen, if you've gone someplace for a while, I want you to come back. Architects who designed cathedrals in the Middle Ages, artisans who began work on cathedrals in the Middle Ages, guess what? They never saw the cathedral. They never saw the cathedral except in their mind, except on the plans, except in the small steps that were, they were taking for there to be a cathedral because it took so long to build something so big that they never saw the finished product. That's cathedral thinking. You start something, you plan something, you have a vision for something, and you get some people to help, and you hope, you hope, that someday, man, that's going to be that's going to be something special, right? Cathedral thinking. You may not see it, but wouldn't you want it? Wouldn't you want it for them? I do. I don't have any grandkids yet. That's another story. Not going to go into that one. <laughs> Some of you do. What about your grandkids' kids? What kind of world would you want them to have? What kind of world do you want them to inherit? What would be good for them? Why not do it now? Huh? Why not? Reminds me of a story. There's always a story, right? Well, this is by Edward Poling. He was an instructor, an educator from a generation ago, and he tells this story about how back in the Middle Ages, there was this supervisor who was inspecting and overseeing the, the building, a building project in France, and he went up to one of the workers and he asked how, how the worker was doing, and the worker turned and looked at him and said, what, are you blind? I'm cutting these impossible boulders with primitive tools and putting them together the way the boss tells me. I'm sweating under the blazing sun. It's back-breaking work, and it's boring me to death. Whew. I'll be giving that guy some space. Went over to another worker and asked the same question. What are you doing? And this worker replied, well... I'm shaping these boulders into usable forms, which are then assembled according to the architect's plans. It's hard work, and sometimes it gets repetitive. But hey, listen, I earn five francs a week, and that supports my wife and kids. It's a job. It could be worse. Well, that's a little better. Huh? Goes up to a third worker. 
asks, what are you doing? And the third worker said, why can't you see? And he lifted his arms to the sky and said, and with inspiration, I'm building a cathedral. That's what I'm doing. I'm building a cathedral. Wouldn't you want to be a part of building a cathedral? We can, you know. Is our current situation often chaotic? Yes. But can we commit to being co-creators with God in making the world a sanctuary, a cathedral that gives glory to God and a life worth living to those who will inherit our decisions, our choices? Chaos happens. But so did you. Thanks be to God. Friends, our hymn of response this morning is number 14 in the glory to God for the beauty of the earth. I invite you to join your hearts and minds and spirits together with me in a time of prayer. Let us pray. Holy God, we turn to you in prayer because we need your guidance. We need your care. We need your sustaining grace. We need someone we can trust, someone who can show us the way in complicated and confusing times. We need someone who stands beside us to help us. We give you thanks, most gracious God, that you have invited us into a special calling with you 
to be co-workers in your creation. It means that we need some wisdom, not just knowledge. It means that we need some reverence to rightly manage resources that are bigger than us so that no one suffers from our abuse of them and that generations to come might continue to praise you for your bounty, that there will be something worth living in and inheriting after we are gone. We ask your presence when we doubt our worth and belovedness, when we doubt our place or overreach, Remind us that we are yours, that we belong, and that we have a place in your life. Remind us and comfort us with the knowledge that in body and soul, in life and in death, we belong to you, our Savior. Help us to imagine with clarity a vision of this earth as a blue speck in space, shared by all your children different colors, different races, different cultures, different ethnicity. Help us, God, to be reminded that we have no other home but this one while we are here. Just as a shepherd knows each of his sheep, help us to know and care for the people around us, to be aware, to be looking and paying attention for those who are sick and the ones who care for them, for the grieving, the ones who are missing someone deeply important to them, for the exhausted and the depressed, for those in need of some resurrection hope, for those who have run into dead ends, for those who need some newness of life. We give you thanksgiving that we are an Easter people and that you have given us minds to think and hearts to love and hands to fashion. May we do so fully aware of your grace. We offer these prayers along with the prayer that we now offer from each of our hearts to yours in silence. Hear the prayers that we speak and the prayers that have been raised to you in silence, all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, the one who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God has been generous and good to us all, friends, humbled by that receiving God's best gifts, let us offer our gifts to God and to the world around us for the sake of Jesus Christ. Let us bring forth our gifts, our tithes, our offerings, our time, our energy, our resources to share on behalf of the world.
God, you meet our needs and transform us for service. Accept these gifts as signs of our gratitude and our commitment to Christ's ministry within the church and throughout the world. We ask it in his name. Amen. Friends, our closing hymn this morning is All Things Bright and Beautiful, number 20, in Glory to God. I invite you to join together with me in the responsive benediction found in the bulletin. We are an Easter people. Live into the hope of Christ's resurrection as good stewards of all that he has redeemed. And may the grace, hope, peace, and love of God, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer, be with you now and always.